And now, with Sound Investing, here's Paul Merriman. Well, it's great to have you back with the three amigos here. We are excited to share some what I think is very interesting information today. Uh, For those of you who are here for the first time, uh, Chris Pedersen is our Director of Research. Uh, He is the youngest of the three. And uh, and Daryl Balls, our Director of Analytics, is the next youngest. And then the old guy here, Paul Merriman, I'm happy to be with you again. I love doing this. These guys love doing this. Please don't forget, they don't get paid a penny. Everything they do is to make you a better investor. So let's see what we can do about that today. Now, I want to just take a minute. There's a question that comes up so often about asset class location. In other words, where do we put our small cap? In our Roth IRA, in our taxable? Where do we put our bonds? Where do we put our REITs, et cetera? Well, there are some simple answers to that but they may not be quite as simple as we'd like them to be because there are so many different kinds of combinations. And so I went to a truth teller. I went to Larry Swedrow. Uh, if you're a, a newcomer to our, uh, our, our work, we have a whole bunch of people that we think highly of and their work in some areas is, is, is better, deeper than what we do here because we focus on some very specific areas of investing. They focus on others. I want to show you a book. I have recommended this book so many times. This is Larry Swedrose, Your Complete Guide to Successful and Secure Retirement. I truly think it is one of the best books that you could read on retirement, whether you're preparing for it or you're in it. And I called Larry. I said, how about doing us a favor? We have this question that comes up often. Would you let us publish your chapter, chapter 10, on asset class location? And he went to the publisher. The publisher said yes. So in the notes to this podcast, you will be able to access that chapter and and read it in detail. Now, I'm going to tell you something about Larry that is pretty doggone amazing. He answers almost, I can't say every, but anybody I ever know that has written to Larry and asked a question, he's answered it. And and when I wrote to him, uh, I I guess I started with an email. It was probably nine or 10 his time, not thinking he was going to get back to me. He got back to me immediately. He is an amazing guy who does not have to work this hard. So I hope, by the way, that you will not only read that chapter and you'll get an idea of the depth of his work, but that you will go on Amazon and I'd like you to read the table of contents because I dare you not to find at least a half a dozen things you'd like to find more about. So uh, I just wanted to start the, uh, the, the program today with that. And then I want to move on to something that is uh, really fun for me, because we had a casual conversation in the last week about another topic that comes up all the time, and that's rebalancing. And uh, it turned out that, that we don't all exactly agree agree on all the aspects of rebalancing. And so I, I think it would be great fun to, uh, uh, to take this one on to start with today and talk about the, the, the good, bad, and the ugly about rebalancing, if there is such a thing as ugly, uh, and, and how the three of us may view rebalancing uh, in, in a different way. So I'm not sure. Uh, Daryl, how do you feel about starting this conversation? Okay. Um, To me, rebalancing is all about controlling. Well, rebalancing controls the asset allocation of your portfolio. But the reason you do that is to control risk in your portfolio. Um, You pick that asset allocation for a reason. And 
uh, you should want to, at least I, want to keep it that way in terms of the risk profile uh, of the, as best I can, of the portfolio. Um, so I rebalance back to my target allocation uh, in order to keep the risk of, of my portfolio consistent with what the risk of that target asset allocation should be or, or is. Um, and, and that's the reason I do it. Uh, I choose to do it when it needs to have it done. And the reason, not on a time basis, and the reason I do it that way or did it that way was, uh, or how, how I do it that way is I use, and this is Larry Swedrow again, Paul, I use his uh, 525 rebalancing method, except I use, I widen the bands a little bit and use, use 10, 1025. Um, and what that is, is if you pick a target asset allocation, say, say 60, 40, and your equities grow to more than 10% away from that allocate that allocation, say it grows to 71, what would it be? 29. Then, then you're outside the plus or minus 10 percentage point band of your target allocation. And so you rebalance back to your target allocation of, of, uh, 60 40 in that case or whatever your your allocation is and um, there are a couple of ways to do that I used to watch it all the time not all the time I used to watch it monthly or so and uh, when I got out of whack then I would put it back now I only look at it once a year or as I got got closer to retirement I only looked at it once a year and if it was within the bounds I let it go uh, and if it was, and uh, it didn't really matter where it went throughout the year, um, <clears throat> as long as when I chose to look at it, if it was within those bounds, that's what I did. Uh, so that's that's kind of the way I look at it, and and how I look at doing it, how I look at implementing it. So so Daryl, the question then also is uh, around the impact of rebalancing in terms of returns. Um, we have shown in our ultimate buy and hold returns uh, going back to 1970, that if you rebalance on a, uh, a, a monthly or an annual basis, there's about a three tenths of 1% better return for the all equity. Now this is important. This is all equity uh, portfolio that is rebalanced less often. Um, any comment on that re regarding the work that you've looked at? Yeah, I think, I think that's consistent with, with what, uh, what I've seen. Um, I did a little, a little study here uh, earlier this week based on some, some hints that Chris gave me. And so I went, let me see if I can find it here. Where'd it go? There we go. Um, using portfolio visualizer. <clears throat> Is there a rebalancing bonus? Well, yeah, sort of, but it's not much. Uh, Paul, I think, will probably disagree with that. But we, I looked at four different methods, um, rebalancing monthly, annually, never, basically. And then I looked at the 10% rebalancing bands. So for the the rebalancing monthly, the ultimate buy and hold portfolio from this is all equity um, from 95 to 2022, the compound annual growth rate for monthly rebalancing was 7.57%. This is out of portfolio visualizer. If you switched and rebalanced annually, in other words, let things run on a little longer before you check in on it, uh, your return goes up by 15 basis points to 7.72%. And then if you let it, and then if you never rebalance over that whole 28 year period, it went up to 7.86 or up, went up another 14 basis points. Um, so over that 30 year period for an investment of $10,000 on day one, if you rebalance monthly, you ended up with about $76,000. If you never rebalanced, it was about $82,000. So that's what that's. Six there thousand. was your three tenths right there. Then between rebalancing monthly and, and never rebalancing never, 
Right. Uh, there's about a three tenths of one percent additional return. Fair enough. Uh, yeah, this is for the all equity part, though. Yeah. Yeah. And so if, if for example, I also looked at a 50 50 portfolio, if you had bonds in it, let's see. And um, I think this was a, a mix of short and intermediate, right, Chris, is what your portfolios had. Yes, it's yeah. it's the same bond portfolio we normally recommend. Right. And so in that case, the compound annual growth rate for monthly was 6.14. And for never rebalancing, it was 6.39. So that's about a quarter of a percent there again also. Um, but the difference in this case is that the max drawdowns were uh, a little more variable. In, in 100% equity, the, all the max drawdowns were around 57% um, in the, over that 28-year period. And in the 50-50 things, they varied from 27 to 34. So that's a little bit, a little bit more uh, variation. That's great. That's great stuff, Daryl. And and. And Chris, would you would you pile on here and uh, add anything to this? Uh, yeah, I I think what it shows is that for somebody with a broadly diversified all equity portfolio, or somebody who's heavily equities, you know, 80, 90 percent, hundred percent equities, the rebalancing didn't make a very big difference over this time period, nineteen ninety five to twenty twenty two. Uh, so for somebody who's invested like that, I, I think an oversaver who has great discipline and tolerance for the ups and downs of the market, whether they rebalance monthly, yearly, every two years, every five years, it's, it's kind of up to them. And I don't think I'd be highly critical. For somebody, though, who has what would be considered a more traditional balanced portfolio with the production of fixed income, um, the fixed income is so different from the equities uh, that the two are likely to grow in different ways and become out of whack. And they're likely to end up in a position where they don't have the amount of protection they want. And so I think for somebody with that kind of a portfolio, the rebalancing is important. And uh, what we see down there is that the monthly or annual rebalance kept the risk in check, but the no, and even the rebalancing bands kept the risk in check, but the no rebalancing, you know, let them go from under 30% of a worst case drawdown to almost 35%. Um, so, you know, you start to, you start to get uncomfortable there and potentially, you know, if you, we know that one of the worst things you can do is exceed your own personal risk tolerance and capitulate, right? Panic sell. So I, I think for somebody with a, a, a substantial fixed income allocation, that rebalancing is really important and um, it should be an important part of what they do on a disciplined, regular basis. Yeah, I think, I think it's interesting to note, Chris is exactly right. If you look at, if you have a, a traditional portfolio, more traditional portfolio where you have bonds and, and equities in it, and you look at the, the drawdowns, as he mentioned, are are a little bit different. The worst year is a little bit different. It's a little more worse. It's about a, about 21% versus about 17% uh, drawdown. The best year is worse. It's 20% versus about 22 or 23% for either monthly or annually or the bands. And the standard deviation, in other words, the roughness of the ride is higher for the monthly, annually, and the rebalance bands, it's around 7.7, 7.8% uh, in terms of standard deviation. But if you never rebalance, it's up about 9.4%. So uh, whereas with the 100% equity portfolio, all those numbers are roughly the same. The standard deviation, the worst year, the max drawdown, they're all about the same between all the different methods. Uh, but once you add fixed income to it, Never rebalancing gets you really out of whack, and and I would I would suppose, although I didn't really look at it in detail, but I would suppose that that's because as you never rebalance over the period of time you're talking about here, it gets more and more equities mm -hmm. as opposed to bonds, fixed right. income, and so the ride gets rougher, the the downs get more down, uh, the worst year gets worse, and the best year gets uh best year gets worse everything gets worse so oh there's something that might get better 
And what might get better is because you had more equity exposure is that at the point that you did suffer the decline that was greater, that you still came out way ahead over the long term. I can tell you uh, in, in looking at the preparing a proposal to my daughter, who's about to, uh, to, to, to have a child, and we're writing, my wife and I are going to write a check to put away for 94 years. Now, the reason I say 94 years is because we happen to have a table that goes back 94 years. So I can look at that table and I could say, what if this little girl grows and has to go through all the same kinds of wild rides that happened from 1928 to 2021? And here's what I know. I know if I give that money to her and suggest that she put it into a portfolio that is half U.S., all U.S., half S&P 500, half small cap value, and get this money that we're gifting into a Roth IRA when she qualifies for a Roth IRA. Now, what I know is that two fund strategy based on a $100 investment in 1928, at the end of 21, was worth uh, almost $4.5 million, about a 12.1% compound rate of return. I also know that if they did not rebalance over that 94-year period, instead of $4.5 million, it's about $7 million. And when I first saw that, I thought, whoa, that's, that's amazing, as we oftentimes do when we see the impact of compounding over very long periods of time. But when you figure out the compound rate of return of the non-rebalanced strategy, it's about three-tenths of 1% better over that 94-year period. And so that Three tenths of one percent that we saw going back to 1970, possibly back to 1995. Uh, it looks like that uh, applies going all the way back to 1928, which I I found was pretty interesting. Now, is anybody going to accuse me of missing something more important? I think one of the things, and it, and it might not apply to your your grandchild, but one of the things that I think. Uh, you have to consider uh, if if you are managing this yourself is is exactly what Chris said is that you have to be wary of the wild ride. I would be interested, and I will probably do this at some point just to check. But I will be interested in to see what happens to your asset allocation and and what happens to your, for example, what happened to your trailing uh, five year or ten year standard deviation as you move through this this period mm-hmm. in terms of of ups and downs and, and max drawdowns and, and worst years and best years and things like that. Because uh, if, if you are counting on something like that and you, you forgot to fasten your seatbelt, let's say, you're liable to smack your head on the top of the roof of your car as you're riding up and down these hills. And so um I will say one thing that that it it you know you could you could argue that annual rebalancing maybe gives you a few tenths of a percent and over an extremely long period of time ninety some odd years that that makes a, a difference in terms of of uh, the length of time that the comp- compounding has to act. This case here, where you're looking at thirty years, roughly thirty years, twenty five to thirty years, you had uh, several a couple of bull markets a couple of, well, three really pretty severe crashes and a lost decade uh, on the S&P 500. So it, it was not exactly a smooth ride. And, and uh, if you look at the, at the uh, ending balances, they're what, six, they're about six, eight, they're about seven or 8% higher on the 100% equity portfolio, 82 versus 77% 
$77,000 for a $10,000 investment. And if you have a if you have a 50-50 portfolio, it's about three thousand dollars out of about fifty-five thousand. So that's again, that's about six, seven percent. So it does make a difference. And if you yeah. have the time, uh, it makes it may it can make a large difference. And so, uh, 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 Paul, there's there's two things I love about what you're doing for your your granddaughter, and congratulations on uh, getting a granddaughter. That's uh, one of life's great blessings. So uh, I'm uh, I'm happy for you. Um, one of the things I love is that your granddaughter is very likely to invest like Rip Van Winkle. She's not going to peak, right? So so the no rebalancing gives gives her a chance to learn a good investing life lesson by the time she does peak. And we know that by the time she does peak in 20 ish years, there's a very high likelihood that small cap value will have outperformed the S&P 500. Yes. And and so that gives her a chance to learn the lesson early in life that, yeah, you know, this diversification is a good thing and having uh, some exposure to small in value is is helpful. Um, the one thing I think I would do slightly differently is instead of the S and P five hundred, I might do a total market. And the reason uh, I would do that is I love being able to go to this granddaughter as she gets older and teach her what it is to own equities and say you own every time you go to a business, you own a piece of that business. Every time you see people going to work, they're going to work for you. Right. You, know, you love Disney. When you watch Disney and they make money, you make a little money too. You know, and I, I, I just think the idea of being able to say that you participate in the whole market is, is kind of, it, that's a really interesting thing. And you could even do that worldwide. You don't have to just do US, you know, you could do worldwide. And so I, I kind of like that story for a young person as they get old enough to understand it. Uh, and we know the returns would not be dramatically different if it was US total market versus S&P 500. If you go worldwide, you know, then it's slightly different. But anyway, I, I think it's fantastic. And I'm really happy for you and your granddaughter. <laughs> well, thanks, Chris. And by the way, <laughs> It is interesting. A couple things to note from what you showed us here, Daryl, is first of all, the CAGR, the, the annualized growth rate here, is not as high as people would expect from an all equity portfolio. And one of the things that has been happening, uh, we normally think of in, in, since 2000, the rate of return on um, the market has been, particularly like the S&P 500, has been around 7%. Uh, now the S&P 500 had an amazing return from about 95 to 99, which was not true of a lot of other equity asset classes. But it, 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 it shows that for long periods of time, you may not get that famous 10%. And by the way, one of the things that the three of us are working hard to do is to find those folks who want to do this themselves so that they didn't have to pay somebody 1% a year. And had it been 1% a year instead of 7.57, it would have been closer to 6.57. So, so uh, there's, there, there is an even bigger payoff if we can find the comfort and the knowledge to be able to do this ourselves. And speaking of that, uh, I, I, I do um, want to, ah, let's see, uh, the next table I'd like to have up, uh, if you would, Daryl is the one on the combination of the S&P 500 uh, and the small cap value indexes. This came to me out of a conversation that uh, I was having with Craig Apple, who is the gentleman who the, uh, the very young gentleman who developed our calculator. And uh, we're gonna have a conversation with Craig about his, his trip to the, to the world of the fire movement, which I think you're gonna find very interesting. But in that fire movement, there are a lot of people who believe that 
all of their money should be in the total market index. And Chris just mentioned that a minute ago, uh, and this is the US total market index that is commonly recommended. And of course, uh, my, our, our position, I would say, not just mine, is that it would be nice to also have some small cap value in that portfolio. And Craig had an opportunity to talk with people who are very committed to total market index only. And one of the reasons is because it is so simple. Of course, I get a little confused in why that recommendation, if you want simplicity, wouldn't be a, a target date fund. But aside from that, when I heard that, that this, this challenge to people to be able to deal with two funds instead of one. Uh, I thought about this table that, that, that you put together. I think it started a couple of years ago, if I'm not mistaken, Daryl. Uh, and in fact, I think this one goes through 2020, not 2021. But this is the fine tuning table where on the left hand column, we have the S&P 500. On the right hand column, we have 100% small cap value. And in between are combinations of the S&P 500 and small cap value. And of course, that led in our work to showing people the implications of 50-50 in each of those. But what what the conversation with Craig led me to kind of maybe to, to, to restate this combination is rather than looking at having a whole bunch of small cap value, much like Chris has in his two funds for life strategy, what if that combination included only a little bit of the small cap value along with the total market index? Well, we don't have the total market index as such in a table, but the S&P 500 has virtually the same return since 1928. In fact, I think there's a one-tenth of 1% 1 advantage to the S&P 500. So for all practical purposes, same return largely because they are both cap weighted, which means the very, very large companies drive most of the return in that index. And what I wanted to take us, and for us to take a look at, in the hopes of thinking in terms of, could we educate the people in the FIRE community to what it suggests if we only put, let's say 10, 20, even 30%, of the money into small cap value. And Daryl, if you'll scroll down so we can look at the end of this uh, 51 year period, you'll notice the S&P 500, the annualized return was 10.7%. If you put 10% into the small cap value, that return goes up four tenths of 1% to 11.1. .1. But what I want you to see is what was the worst 12 months when you look at those two. Well, the worst 12 months for the S&P 500 only was a loss of 43.3 versus 43.9. Correct. Correct. Yes. Okay. So, you took a little bit, and if we looked at the worst drawdown, the worst decline before it turned around and went back up, the difference is 51% for the S&P 500 versus 51.6%. In other words, they are virtually the same in terms of the risk characteristics, but one produced four-tenths of 1% 1 more. But we need to go further. We need to go further because if we go to 20%, the return is 11.4%. And yes, the worst 12 months was 44.5 compared to 43.3 .3 from where we started. And the worst drawdown was 52.4 versus 51. Again, I cannot believe 
that anybody would remember that difference when they were going through it. I can tell you, nobody was happy when that was going on. But what was the impact of that extra, extra risk, if you want to call it? You picked up now seven tenths. And if you just go one more column over to 30% in the small cap value and 70% in the S&P 500 or total market index. Now you have added 1% from the original, an additional 1%. And we have talked ad nauseum about what does an extra half of 1% mean to a lifetime investor? Million to $2 million. So we're talking about potentially a million to $2 million worth of additional money coming out of these investments over a lifetime and what you leave for others by going up to a 30% small cap value. And what do I see on the worst drawdown? What do I see on the worst 12 months? Still, the, the differences are minimal and not the kind of differences that would cause one to feel like, oh my God, I've done something stupid here. And by the way, it's worth mentioning, and I know short-term returns don't mean a thing, but when I look at this year, guess what has done better? Small cap value or the S&P 500? I think there's a 5 or 6% advantage, even though it's still a loss, with small cap value this year versus the S&P 500 or the total market index. Now, you too, Chris, please. Fire away. What more would you add to what I've just said? Well, some people listening may, they, they may be hearing the annualized return went up by three tenths and the, the uh, worst case drawdown went down by a similar amount. You know, th those sound like they're in the same ballpark. You know, what's the big deal? Well, you have to remember that the annualized return comes in, it, it's compounded over all of the years that you're invested. So you get, it's like you get that benefit, that few tenths of a percent across the whole 30 years, 40 years. The worst drawdown, you, you might only experience once. Um, you know, may, yeah. Maybe you experience something similar twice, but, but there's short term pain compared to the long term gain. And so even though the numbers sound like they're in the same ballpark, the annualized return numbers are way more important. Terrific. Daryl, yeah, do you think want to add? I, two things. I think the the drawdowns here, uh, like Chris mentioned, they're they're not that they aren't that different, but the drawdowns represent to me, represent a behavioral finance risk of, of risk of capitulation. Yeah. And you know, if if you're okay with a 51% drawdown, but not with a 53.5% drawdown, I think you need to ask yourself why you think you're that smart to know the difference between the, the between that little bitty difference yeah. and so if you're not going to capitulate at 51 percent with a total market index why would you at 53 percent if you even knew that that was the difference and so i think going to 3070 uh small cap value total market or s p 500 is is not a big leap in terms of additional risk um, for the potential benefit you get with a potentially uh, in, the, in the past, for example, over this 50 some odd years uh, of a one one percent difference in your compound annual. You get that every year, not consistently, but over time, you would, that was your annual um, difference in return. The other thing I would point out is down here on the lower right is that how often did did the small cap value portfolio, these are 100% numbers, outperform the total market or the S&P 500. And you see that more often than not, although it's about 50-50 over this 50 some odd year period, 51 year period, I guess it is, uh, the, S &P, the small cap value did better 27 years and the S&P did better 24 years. Uh, so that's essentially half the time, one way or the other, uh, they they kind of bounce back and forth, and so yeah. the good news is you got some of both. And so when when one's doing better, it pulls the other one up, uh, and so that that helps. But the, the other the other key difference, and this is where I think these these differences in returns comes from, is that when the small cap value portfolio outperforms 
the the S and P five hundred portfolio, it does so by almost five percent. No, by almost six percent rather. Um, when the S and P outperforms the small cap value, it it returns it it does eleven percent better per year than the small cap value did. When small cap value outperforms the total market, it does almost seventeen percent, sixteen point eight almost a 17% better. And so even though they kind of ping pong back and forth, half and half, when the small cap value does better than S&P 500, it does better, much better than when the small, than when the S&P 500 outperforms the small cap value. And this question comes up later, but I'm, I'm going to address it now. And basically I'm, rest I'm restating the question a little bit, but what, the person wants to know is if they follow our advice today, are we expecting them to keep doing this for the rest of their life? Now, I, I, I didn't mention I was going to bring this topic up today, so, so, uh, but it's certainly something that's been on my mind recently, particularly when I think about this, this wonderful little girl is coming into the world. And uh, her grandfather and grandmother want these wonderful things to be done in terms of being able not only to have more maybe security herself, but to be able to do good for the rest of the world is, is when we're not around. And the three of us are not going to be around forever. It's one of the interesting challenges. Daryl, how many years are you going to be around? Yeah, uh, till the end. <laughs> Well, I'd like to think I've got another 15-year run. Yeah, maybe. maybe. But, but not doing this. I suspect they will have put me out to pasture before I get to 15 years. But it does, does pose a very interesting question about, okay, I buy the idea of the best in class that Chris comes up with, with the ETFs. But Chris, what would you tell somebody? Who, who is depending on these, these great picks that you put together, what would you tell them about um, 30 years from now <laughs> beyond the point that you're likely to be wanting to be doing this? What would you tell them? What do they do? I, you know, I think to the extent that they can stick with one plan, that they can pick one and stick with it, uh, it'll be better for them. But uh, there will be twists and turns along the way. Fund names will change. Funds will go out of business and be acquired. Uh, they'll learn new things. Um, somewhere along the way, they may exceed their risk tolerance and, and uh, panic sell. And I, I think the Jack Bogle quote of, you know, you'll do all right as long as you don't do too many things wrong. Um, I, I think that's true. We're, we're all making mistakes all the time. Uh, and uh, I, I think uh, this is where either an advisor or a sounding board can be really helpful. If you can find somebody, maybe it's your companion, maybe it's another investor. If you can find somebody you can talk to along the way about the big decisions you're thinking about making, I think that's a great way to short circuit a lot of the mistakes and then slowing down as well. So, you know, you hope that people are consistent and find something they can stick with for the long term. But reality is that, you know, we're all going to make changes along the way and uh, just hopefully not too many big mistakes and we'll be OK. You have just reminded me of advice I gave to folks many, many years ago that if you could find somebody else as committed to this process as you are. To, to, to do the right thing, to understand how the process works in your best interest. If you could find that partner, then you could, in essence, manage each other's money uh, to, to, to take the, the emotion out of that process. Now, I know there's a lot of things that could go wrong with that, but the idea is your idea, Chris, of finding somebody to work with that it isn't going to charge you one percent, but is going to be working to the to the same end that you are to help bring that peace of mind that you need. And Daryl, do you want to add anything before I go on? I'm not nope, sure. I'm good. Okay, good, good. There you go. Okay, that's great. Well, 
Thanks for that, guys. Uh, good stuff. I want to read a letter. It, it, it's, it's a little lengthy, but there's a, a great story in this letter. Karen says, I'm not sure if you will read this or even respond. I feel stuck. I mean really stuck. I love to research things before I make decisions. I read your book. We're talking millions and perens for my daughter who is investing at 18 and doing well. It was fantastic. I have listened to so many YouTube videos, podcasts from Choose FI to Bigger Money Pockets, Clark Howard, Dave Ramsey, Stacking Benjamins, and so many more. They all have fantastic advice. I'm still stuck. I haven't made any meaningful changes to my portfolio, even though I've been researching for over two and a half years. The problem is there are too many choices. They all look good, every single one of them. I'm definitely a do-it-yourself investor. We came to it late. We need every penny we can to work for us. I definitely feel I'm able to do this. I just can't make a decision. I'm in my early 40s. Uh, I do not work, but feel like my part-time job is keeping up with all the investment research and news, and my husband's in his mid-50s. We currently have a very small $250,000 in total investments between 401ks and Roth IRAs. And she goes on to talk about, I'm, I'm acutely aware of how far we are away from our target goal, but I also now know that we're better off than others. Since we are late to the game, I just worry that whatever plan we choose will be the wrong one. I am perfectly willing to set it and forget it, and I love the idea of passive investing and indexes. Uh, they give me a safe and secure feeling of good diversity. I can ride the market. I have no problem with that either. I would consider myself conservative to moderately aggressive, although I sometimes think I should be more aggressive. Uh, given the fact that we are behind our goal to retire at age 60, 67. And she goes on and she talks about how great the two, three, and four fund strategies are, uh, the work that we're doing and others, but she is still not able to make the decision. She says, I know you probably get a lot of emails from a lot of people, so I apologize for not keeping this brief. If you're able to give me any insight, I would love to hear from you, Karen. And my God, does my heart go out for Karen. And so the question is, can the three of us turn Karen's life around? And I've got some ideas. You guys have got some ideas. Chris, why don't you, why don't you come out of the gate first on this one? Well, one of the first things that strikes me is that her email presupposes she needs to change something. And she didn't tell us what her portfolio is. She might not. She may be just fine. Um, so, you know, that that's interesting in and of itself. Uh, she might she might actually have the right instincts that her portfolio is OK the way it is and leaving it alone is just fine. Um, uh, the other thought is that when you're stuck like that, finding somebody to talk to who can advise you, it's not us, we can't, but finding somebody you could might be very helpful. So finding a fee only advisor willing to talk to her for a few hours, you know, even if it costs a few hundred dollars or even small thousands, you know, a thousand or two thousand dollars might be worth it in the long run to have that confidence that either what she has is fine or that there's a prudent change she could make that will improve her chances of meeting her goals. And um, in her case, especially since she feels behind, somebody who has planning skills and the software to run some scenarios for her to let her know whether she's going to be able to catch up or not, I think would be really useful. So I, I think um, in her case, finding a little bit of professional help could probably be very, very good. Terrific. Daryl? Yeah, I, I, I feel for her because it is hard to change your portfolio or to, or to do something to pull the trigger. It, um, it, it really is. You're always worried about doing the wrong thing. But I think this is, it, it's, she under, she's done enough research and she's got a, a, 
a field of good choices for the most part in front of her um, to pick from. And I think it's like Chris mentioned earlier, you know, things you only have to do a few things right. As long as you don't do too many things wrong, you'll be OK. And I think picking again, for the most part, any one of those portfolios is is going to be not wrong. Um, I used to have a, a mentor who said, you know, the better is the enemy of the good enough. And so many of those portfolios will be good enough. Um, and, and it's hard to say which one's going to be the best, but but many of them, maybe most of them, are going to be good enough. And that's where the advisor might be able to help you. Um, one thing I would uh, offer to her is that we have a, a, a suite of what we call no-nonsense portfolios. And they're, they're simple portfolios. They have one, two, three, or four funds in them, equity funds. And then uh, and and they they kind of cover the gamut of a lot of different things. Um, but one thing I would offer for her is to take a look at that uh, at that, those portfolios on the website. Um, and I'll just point out a, a couple of things here if I can figure out how to share this. There we go. So this is. This is kind of a comparison data table that we have. There's a lot of numbers on here and it's very busy. And uh, I, I apologize for that, but if you take the time and you look at it, there's really some good information on here, um, I think. So, uh, and the one thing I would draw her attention to is the US four fund portfolio. Um, the, she mentioned in her email, she mentioned J.L. Collins, for example, which he's a total U.S. market person, uh, which is essentially the S&P 500. And so over the last 50 years or so, that's had about 11 percent return. Well, the U.S. 4 fund has had a 13.2 percent return. That's a high, a 2 percent per year higher on average return than the total market. Uh, it's four funds, and and you know, and you have you can rebalance it, but it sounds like she's capable to do that, uh, has capability to do that. But the other thing is that I think since they do have a short period of time, I think it's important to look at the consistency of returns. And if you look at at the uh, total market, the decadal returns for the seventies, eighties, nineties, aughts, and tens, let's say. They had 6% for the 70s, 17% for the 80s, 18% for the 90s, 0% for the aughts, 15% for the 10s. So it bounces around quite a bit. The four fund had about 11, 19, 17, 6, and 14. It's a much smoother ride. Uh, I added some numbers to our table here. This number down below here, 5.1%, that's the standard deviation of the decadal returns. The, uh, and it's 5.1% for the four fund. It's almost 8% for the total market. So the ride is much, it's much smoother and it's more dependable. And her husband in his mid fifties and they're targeting retirement at 67, they have a short time horizon, 10 to 15 years maybe. Uh, so looking at these decadal returns gives you a feel for how in the past, how dependable the returns have been for these different portfolios. If we take a look at that and we and we see how these, I don't know how many there are here, nine, nine portfolios, see how they stack up uh, relative to each other for each decade during the past 50 years. So here you, you can see on this chart here, and we can probably put this in the show notes, can't we, Paul? Sure. sure. Uh, so, uh, this is the portfolio. On the left here, we have the portfolios of these nine or whatever they are portfolios. Eleven, I think. Sorry? I think there are 11. 11 portfolios um, ranked by their returns for each decade, the 70s, for example. Um, the S&P 500 is at the bottom with a 5.8% compound annual growth rate. The all-value world... Worldwide is at the top with a 14% growth rate. But if you look at the four fund, it had an 11.5 or it had a 10.5%. It's in the middle. It's this blue one here. 
And this was from 70 to 79. 70 through 79, right. And the green down here is, is the total market. And, and it was six. If you go to the 80s, U.S. four fund is in the middle again with almost 19. Total market had 18, but it's at the bottom. Not that 18 or 17. Not that that's a bad return, but it's at the bottom and the four fund did better. In the 90s, uh, the U.S. four fund had 17 and the total market had 18. In the in the tens or the aughts rather, the four fund had a six percent return, and the total market had zero, zero. You're no better off at the end than you were at the beginning. Uh, in the in the teens or tens, total market had a fifteen, and the four fifteen point two, and the four fund had a thirteen point seven. Kind of in the middle of the stack again for the four fund, and not that much worse than the total market. Um, like back in the 80s when the four fund was a little bit better, but not a lot than the total market. So the point of all this is, is that the total market bounces around from of these 11 portfolios, which are all fairly simple and straightforward. Um, the total market, you know, spent three out of the five decades at the bottom and two at the top. So you... <laughs> It was not always uh, a best performer. The four fund is in the middle and, and had fairly consistent returns when you look at them decade by decade. So with only 15 years to go, uh, I think that, that having the four fund as your equity portion of your portfolio will provide a smoother re return with the, with the opportunity for higher returns than the total, total market. If you go back and you look at this here, it was over that 50 year period, it's 2% per year better. Uh, I think that that's great stuff, Daryl. And uh, uh, I, I would just add one other possibility. Um, if she is this nervous about every step that she takes, uh, it, 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 could be, it could be difficult, but let's say, I'm gonna take her at her word. She looks at her job as to, she says, I do not work, but feel like my part-time job is keeping up with all investment research and news. I would like to believe that a good buy and hold investor maybe has to spend five or 10 minutes a week keeping up because you're a buy and hold investor. You're not looking for the information to make the next move. So I've got an idea. You have found some wonderful folks in terms of their desire for you to do well on your own. And so how about taking that $250,000 and breaking it up, you got time, breaking it up into five different portfolios independently managed using, for example, out of our collection, you, maybe you could use the worldwide value portfolio for one portfolio. Maybe you use the, the four fund US for another portfolio. Then you hire JL Collins. I don't mean you're gonna hire him, but you're gonna use his advice and put another part of the portfolio into the total market index. And But you find, I don't know what Paula Pants recommends. I, I, I don't know what uh, some of these others recommend, but I do know that if you look at them as all being fantastic, then why do you put them, all five of them, or whatever it amounts to, have five different portfolios that have some differences, maybe something with some international in the portfolio, that you're not going to get with the four fund US. You're not going to get with the JL columns. And use that to spend your time. And by the way, Daryl's right, Chris is right. We have no idea which of these strategies are going to be the best for the rest of your life. And of course, the older we get, the less dependable uh, those expected returns are likely to be. I, I hope that is. Uh, I hope that is helpful, Paul. If, if I can just add yes, one last please. one last thought for Karen, if she's really committed to the DIY path, um, I, similar to your idea, uh, but 
more incremental. Um, she could take 1% per month. So, you know, she could, every month, she could say, what truth do I, did I learn that I believe in that is not reflected in my portfolio? And then take 1% of the portfolio and put it in that. And if she did, I, I, the thing I like about that is that, you know, that's 12% per year. In eight years, she will have touched the whole portfolio. So it's gradual. Um, but it gives her practice too. Every month you do something and every month you do something, you realize it didn't kill you, <laughs> right? You know, it's like, oh, I can trade. I can, I can do it without making a mistake, right? You know, and, and uh, so it's just another way to break it down because you, your approach would have her trade everything in the first month into these five different portfolios. And that might just be too much. It would freak her out. So, and maybe it's 2% per month, whatever it is. I, I think, I think that's another way to come at it is just move little bits, you know, move little pieces and, uh, and over time evolve and, and then you'll build confidence and be able to do bigger changes over time too. That's great. I think one other, I think one other thing that she should think about, and that's that, uh, what is, what will be your, your post retirement asset allocation? Is will have some fixed income in it. And so maybe not right now, but sometime probably in the next five to seven years, you will have to start gliding towards that retirement allocation. So she should think about what that allocation is. And then as part of her five minutes a month, look at what the glide path would need to be and when it would start. Um, I think that's good. I'm a little, I'm a little, I, I look at, Chris's touch it every month with a little bit of trepidation because, and, and I think you have even said this, Chris, is, is your portfolio is like a bar of soap. Every time you touch it, it gets smaller. And so um, I think DIY buy and hold is, is just that. Um, I don't know that she needs to do it all at once. It's inside her her 401k and IRA. So I'm not, so there are no tax implications, but if she wanted to, it's not really a dollar cost averaging, I guess, but if she wanted to transition to whatever portfolio she decides over a month, that would be fine. But, uh, and, I and if she really, if she really wants to go crazy with work, then she can go to, uh, the article entitled 150, portfolios better than yours, uh, in, in which the, at the White Coat Investor, uh, where they have looked at 150 different portfolios that they believe are all legitimate portfolios. The, the one thing, and in responding to, to what Chris said, is if she is now presently all in equities, but the equities don't represent strategies that somebody has taken a, a look at in terms of their likeliness to, to, to work for them, to do it all at one time and get it into five different portfolios is probably one, going to be more diversification than she has now. Two, is likely going to be in the kinds of funds that she should be in, I hope index funds. And, and, and three will uh, represent portfolios that will give her a return that will meet her needs. Gentlemen, thank you for that. I'm gonna move on here to uh, an email. Uh, says, I appreciate all that you and your foundation do for financial education. I'm 44 years old with a long investment investing horizon. When I first created my allocation, I intended for a small cap value tilt, which I have with my U.S. equities. I may have misread that. At the time, I do not have access to a good small cap value international fund, which I now have via ETS. Do you think it would be better now to change from my international small cap blend, uh, a, a Vanguard uh, a fund to the international small cap value uh, that uh, Chris has in his best in class. That's uh, an Avantis uh, a small cap international value. Um, would you expect better long-term performance by doing so? 
Chris, what say you? I I would expect higher uh, returns in an international small cap value fund over an inter international small cap blend over the long term, uh, provided it's got a good expense ratio and a reasonable exposure to the factors. Um, and it sounds like he has access to a good fund. So that would be the case. Uh, there's no guarantees though. You could go a decade, you could yeah. go, you know, two decades, even in the, uh, you know, there's just no guarantees um, with, without seeing that benefit. So, uh, you know, I, I think if you're going to do it, you do it based on a firm belief in the academic research and the historical returns, and then you look away and you let it go. <laughs> That's great. Daryl? No, I, I agree with Chris. The only thing, and I don't, I don't know enough about the factors and how the international small cap value indexes are constructed, but, but I, I, I suspect, or I've heard that that's probably a very small asset class. Yes. And so I would, I would be concerned about whether there's enough there to, to construct a, a good quality index and, and maintain it uh, over time. But Chris is way more knowledgeable about this than I am. Um, and also, I think, I don't know if this, this is uh, the case now of going from the international small cap blend to the international small cap value. Uh, is is again another case of enemy is of enemy of better is the enemy of the good enough. I'm not sure about that. Uh, you know, in theory, yes, it should have a higher expected return, but I would just be a little concerned about it. But that's me. Well, there are a lot of international small cap value companies, Chris. I don't know if you know. How many of the Avantis have in that particular portfolio? Do you know? I don't know off the top of my head, but I'm not worried about the Avantis fund being bigger than the market opportunity at this point. Okay. If, if it was Vanguard uh, and it was a really popular fund, I might be a little more worried about it. But even DFA, who's been around for ages, they, they have a very, very large investment in that part of the market. And that's true. Uh, still and still invest there out of the belief that there is a premium to be had and meaningful diversification benefits to be had as well. Uh, I sit corrected. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will just add that looking at the DFA um, a book that I have here, and we look from 1990 to 2021, whether you look at the small cap growth versus small cap value, there's about a 2% advantage to the small cap value. Or if we look at the large cap blend versus the small cap value, there is also about a 2% compound rate of return advantage. So in, in, intuitively, I, I would think too that that small cap of value is, is, is going to be better. Uh, you know, you guys, um, we have spent a lot of time on, on, on the questions we've gone over. Is there a question you really, of the, of the group that we were gonna do, Either one of you got a question you really wanted to, to, to focus in on and share some information? I, I have one and I can probably, I can, I can make it quick. Um, we had a question about uh, a woman who was concerned about her daughter. Ah, yes. Um, and uh, she was 64 years old and retired and her daughter was 36 and has some challenges. Um, and what the, the mother wanted to do was set up a fund for her daughter so her daughter could, could uh, retire. And she asked whether or not the Vanguard Life Strategy Moderate Growth Fund would be a good, a good alternative to start putting some money in and have, have uh, whatever, whatever proceeds or whatever funds came along at the time uh, go into that fund for her daughter. And, uh, and I think that that's probably a good a good uh, option, uh, but I would offer a different, something different for her to think about. Um, and that would be maybe a target date fund. Uh, the, the VSD 
BX is a 60-40 fund. And so it, it's got a risk profile like this. This is a an, this is an asset allocation table for a, the Vanguard target date glide path. And it goes from, uh, for those who can't see, it goes from years, years to target date and then to beyond the target date and shows how different funds are allocated between U.S. and international stocks and U.S. bonds and international bonds and some short-term tips. But uh, the point here is, is that uh, the the fund she picked has a constant asset allocation of 60%. And so if she puts it in there and lets it ride, uh, even into her retirement, her daughter will have a fund that has 60-40%. If she puts it in the target date fund, say she picks the 2055, that's what, about 30 years from now, 20 years from now, 25 years from now, let's say. Um, she will start out young. She's, she's right kind of in this ballpark right here where, where it would 25 years before retirement, where it would be 90%. And so she would get the advantage of having a higher equity allocation and higher returns potentially early on in the phase here. And then as she gets closer and closer to retirement, it will automatically reduce the bond, reduce the equity allocation down to a lower risk profile to where by the time she's a few years after retirement, it'll be down to 30% and nobody has to do anything that happens automatically. And, uh, and I think it gives her a, the opportunity for higher returns early on and moves her to a lower risk profile as she nears retirement. That's, That's that good. Was, and, and the other thing that she could do, taking your advice, she, she could, maybe she's worried about having any more than, than uh, 60% in equities, in which case she could go to the lifestyle fund now, but she should be prepared to move it into a target date fund later on when that target date fund is sitting on 60% uh, uh, equities and then let it go in the target date fund from that point on. I mean, she just may not want to expose her, her money to that much risk. Uh, in a well, the other thing is the mother is, the mother is 64 now, and, it, and the target date fund won't reach 60% for about another 20 years. So her mother, the mother would be 84 then. Uh -huh. And she may or may not, you yeah. know, nobody yeah. knows, but she may or may not be around. Yeah. to help her daughter at that point. Yeah. And that's what I like about the target date fund. It, 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 it's automatic and it gives you the opportunity for, for better returns early on and manages your risk after retirement. Terrific. And, and that, that's great, Daryl. And Chris, do you have a, a, another topic you were going to uh, wanted to talk about? Uh, nope. Nope. I think we're good. Okay. Well, you guys have done it again. You are absolutely wonderful. And, uh, and I get credit for things that I have not done. And I want to be very careful in this regard. Uh, like somebody will write and say to me, uh, you and Chris uh, have done a great job at blank. You know, no, it was Chris did a great job at whatever that project might be. The same with Daryl. I, I am really but a lowly teacher here passing on the, the good work of these folks. And, and, and along, by the way, with our truth tellers. So it's, that, it's good uh, that you're humble, Paul, but we couldn't do what we do without you. Well, I, I appreciate that. And it's great to have you on the teams. So thanks to you and thanks to all of you. Oh, by the way, I'm not sure when this conversation is going to be released. If it is prior to November 5th, I just want you to know that I'm going to be spending a morning on November 5th with Tom Cock. We'll be, we'll be sending out information, but uh, Tom and I are going to have a conversation about things that are on the minds of uh, people either close to or in retirement. Uh, I worked with Tom for many, many years. Uh, he, he is, as well as far as I'm concerned, a, a great truth teller, and I'll be happy to be there with him. We will not have Don with us, uh, Don McDonald, but it's going to be a great day for me, and I hope for the people who can choose. They can be there live or they can be there online. So, uh, uh, watch for that notice, if you will. And, uh, and we, all three of us, wish you all the very best. And we want to be part of the team to help you have a better financial future. Thanks for being with us. 
It's Paul Merriman with Sound Investing. Sound Investing, soundinvesting.com and paulmerriman.com are produced and exclusively owned by Paul Merriman, who is solely responsible for their content. For more information, free articles, mutual fund recommendations, and more, visit paulmerriman.com.